Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Super Talk. Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Super Talk. Excited about today's Super Talk demand. We have a visitor all the way from Austin, Texas. We have Dr. Charles Charles Martinez, and he is the dean of the College of Education for the University of Texas. So, Doc, thanks for being here. Appreciate you. Really happy very, to be very here. Much. Yes, thank and you. And Demond, I know we were talking about the importance of higher ed just the other day, and and just the fact that we want all all of our students. We know every student is some kind of smart. We know that every student has potential. But just knowing that for us in this space, with regard to relationships with universities, we're blessed because we have a tremendous relationship with UT Austin. And it's it's people like you, Doc, that, that make it possible. But, but one of the things is just getting to know you, the person, and your background. And I think that's what makes you such an exceptional dean, is that you have just this, this vast array of experiences. But if you would, for those that are listening, there's going to be a lot of people out there. Just just you. What's your story? Where were you raised? How did you get where you are? Um, well, I'm really excited to be here, too. Uh, and you asked me about my story. I will uh, share a little bit about that. But to put it in the front, our stories matter. And so I know you lead this way, too, but it is it is who I am. So I'm never afraid to tell my story because if you want to know what I care about, why I'm impatient... What I value, you have to know where it comes from. And so I think we need to re- keep our humanity in the room mm-hmm. when, we're, when we're leading, as you have and as I try to do. Um, so my, my story, this could take a much longer podcast. <laughs> so I'll give you the slightly abridged um, version. Um, I'm the grandson of immigrants, um, third generation Mexican-American. I grew up in San Diego, California. Uh, and was raised primarily by a single Latino father who raised two daughters and a son virtually on his own, um, but had the help of a, of a roommate who became a second parent figure who was a teacher. Um, so I have a unique tie to what we do in these education spaces because of that um, background. Um, but being raised by a single father um, which is an unusual story in and of itself. It really is. Yeah, um, you usually hear single mother raising right. family. This is single father. And my dad would tell stories about particularly raising girls as a, as a single Latino father. Um, the challenges <laughs> Could have been a sitcom. of... <laughs> yes, two, two men actually, he, he and, and the man who was sort of my second dad, um, raising two girls, right? Uh, but, um, but it's an important part of who I am, for sure, that the, the upbringing. You know, I'm, as a clinical psychologist, I pay a lot of attention to moments in life where small doses of support can make a big difference. And I have those in my own life because if you look at my life, you know, by the time I was in fourth grade, I had been to a dozen different schools between second and fourth grade, um, shipped around from one family member to another during a very difficult divorce that my parents had. And before that stability entered my life, there were lots of challenges being brown and poor and having a disrupted home and having, you know, lots of schooling, but always being a ghost inside those schools because I was not a troublemaker. I was the... I was the invisible kid, you know, in those never caused trouble, but never got noticed. And so those schools were really just, I was an echo in those spaces. Um, So that was really challenging to kind of have those experiences and then be set right. But when my father was able to get custody and create a home, um, everything changed. And so I really pay attention to those moments where small doses of support, the right people at the right time can help trajectory change. And that's been a big part of, I think, who I am as a leader and how I think about UT Austin and the work we do in our college is to find these precious moments where small doses of support can change a life. And that's when we're at our best inside what you do in K-12 and what we do in higher education. And I love that. And I know there's a lot of kids out there and you may be a child or you may be even be a parent. You're, you're raising kids on your own or your little boy or little girl out there who's just got a mom or a dad and and I know that, that sometimes things seem like they may be impossible, but we have Dr. Martinez here that, that's proven that regardless of your challenges, regardless of your background, regardless of your circumstances, that if you stay focused and if you're hungry and if you work hard, that you can 
you can break down those barriers. So that's really what the super talk is about, Doc. It's about capturing these stories and, and trying to inspire somebody out there. And so my another question I have is what advice do you have for a student that's out there that may be in a similar situation? It's maybe hurting right now, maybe in crisis right now and, and, and doesn't really see the light at the end of the tunnel. What, what advice do you have for that kid? You know, the, um, if people read my bio, they look at my resume, it tells a very, uh, clear, precise story. It looks as if where I've arrived was there by plan, mm. but it's not how our stories unfold. Those moments of crises, those apparent failures and worries that we have accompany all of our lives. They just don't end up in our bios. Say, oh, I did this. I was the first in my family to go to college. I went on and got my graduate degrees. I became a professor. I did all the, it looks orderly. And, it, and I think of these moments when we struggle, we, we see people around us and we think their lives are orderly, but they're not. Our, our successes are paved by the struggle. Mm. And they're not in your bio, the struggles. Those times when I didn't know if I could do it. Um, being the first in my family to go to college and I went to a private, small liberal arts college in California, there weren't kids who looked like me. And there weren't kids who were working. I had to work 40 hours a week as a college student. And that was not a thing. It shouldn't be a thing, but it was for me because I had to pay my own way. And so um, when you have those experiences, often you, you just get stuck in the fact that you're struggling or it feels like you're on the brink of failure at every moment. But in the end of the day, those failures are the things I point to as driving my success. It's, you know, our only real failure is when we can't live up to our values. If you're struggling, but you stay clear, of, clear about who you are, what you care about, what you're trying to do in this world, it provides a protective bubble even around those moments of, of struggle and self-doubt. And I love that advice. And, and I think we're so blessed, Amon. Here we're sitting with the dean of the College of Education yes. for one of the finest universities in the country. Uh, UT Austin is, is booming. It's growing. And, and we're so blessed to have you leading up there. I think that uh, for us, I, a lot of times you go through the motions of, of doing what you do and you work very hard to get where you're at. But you don't truly know how many people that you're inspiring and how many doors that you're breaking down and how many people that you're giving hope. So I just wanted to say on behalf of the entire district and Harlingen, Texas, our board, we're, we're proud of you. We're part of our proud of our relationship with you, but just you as an individual, because I think that that's something I think that to the students that are out there, just take that advice and and take it to heart and just get out there and get after it and take your take your struggles with you. And, and if you happen to be a child, I, you know, I'm thinking I'm thinking of my kids. I have three kids. Josh was in, in fourth grade. My little girl Sammy's in fifth grade, and and Joe's in sixth grade. And and they're fortunate. They have mom and dad at mm -hmm. home, and and they're fortunate. You know, we we are both blessed with with good jobs, but it still doesn't mean that they have to understand the importance of hard work and resiliency too. So if you're a student out there that that has mom and dad that that's in a a blessed situation, just I don't want you all to feel complacent or I don't want you all to feel that things are just going to fall in your lap or I don't want students that are blessed with mom and dad and, and just in, in, in good financial situations to feel like, I mean, that your parents worked hard to put you in that situation. So so to, to you, to my children and, and those that are in that situation, we're talking to the whole spectrum, whether you're a child that's struggling right now or a child that has everything right now, hard work works. And you got to grind and you got to push and you can't feel sorry for yourself. And you got you can't think the world is, is going to just hand you things or that life is fair. So I'm hoping that that little nugget out there just taps into somebody's heart and really transforms them. Demond, what are you thinking? Well, I looked at your resume and it's extremely impressive. Um, but I think that the thing that I really would want to know and what, what people would also want to know is is kind of, are there moments, because I know in looking at what you're doing, you're fighting a lot for diversity. Uh, you are fighting a lot on behalf uh, for, for the voiceless um, in, in what I'm seeing and what you've done. 
Are there days in which the struggle has been to the point where you went, you know what, is this really what I should be doing? Or are there moments in which you go, like, what was the defining moment that let you know, I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing, where I'm supposed to be doing it. And I know despite all of the struggles that come with that, because anytime you bring diversity, especially into an educational system, it's going to be met with a lot of opposition. So can you kind of speak to that? Yeah, it's an, I mean, it's a great question. It's an interesting moment, of course, for all of us in this, in this work, the, the kind of culture war that's taken over the country correct, has imbued what is effectively non-negotiables inside our particular public education systems, both at the K-12 level and at higher ed, but it's imbued it with a, a, a political edge and it can be per, per, paralyzing. It's certainly mm -hmm. a perilous moment, but it also can be paralyzing. Um, but here's the thing, you know, the, um, these systems, what, what happens in K-12, what happens in public higher ed in particular, that work is not actually negotiable. Mm. So I, I don't debate that with myself. I think there are, there are credible reasons why we've fallen into this complicated moment. There are sometimes inability of these institutions to articulate the, their core responsibilities in ways that are, are truly not political. But there's no reason that we create politics around things that are not. K-12 public education in this country has a responsibility to serve all kids. Those environments have to create safe spaces for all kids. Mm -hmm. That's not on the table. How we do that is really about how we create inclusion and belonging. You know, words that can get highly polarized and politicized um, are actually baked into our responsibilities. If we're not doing that every day inside the K-12 system, we're failing students. And these systems have failed too many students for too long. I can't negotiate that away. It, it causes me no dissonance to stay committed to that. Mm. In public higher education, these are our best venues to create social mobility for the next generations of Texans and for the next generation of young people in this country. That's what they're there for. To do that well, we have to reach all of our communities. We have to ensure that every student who has the capability of being successful at a place like UT Austin has access to it mm. and has what they need there to be successful. That also is not inherently political, but we imbue it with politics. So I think we have to stay close together um, at times when we we're more fractured and remind ourselves those basic things, the need to create equitable opportunities, the need to ensure that students feel safe and connected, engaged, um, that we respond to the disparities that continue to dominate our fields. Um, those are joining points that don't have to have the, the, the divisiveness around them if we don't let ourselves imbue them with politics. I do get asked a lot these days, you know, why are you still in Texas? Mm. Um, you know, I spent my career largely on the West Coast. This kind of work around equity leadership is something I care very deeply about. But I work really hard not, not to make it a, I don't, I don't engage in performative acts in this space. I'm too impatient about the failures of our system to serve all students and our failures of our health system to create equity in terms of outcomes to, you know, be puffy chested about things. Mm -hmm. um, so why am I in Texas? When I get asked that question, I say, you know, Texas matters. These topics in a place where 10% of the young people, 18 years and younger in the whole country reside here mm. in the state, that it looks demographically like where the country has been, but also where it's going at the same time. In a way, this divisive, complicated political moment, it makes sense that it would be sitting here in Texas and our ability to grapple with it together, to find the common ground, to, to maintain our urgency about improving these systems on behalf of the future of Texas, where else would you want to be? Mm. You know, I, when I go back on the West Coast, I do feel a little bit of an echo chamber, and I don't feel that here. The work here matters. Mm. I know it's complicated, but, it, but if we can talk past the 
the concerns about words and phrases and keep the conversation real and keep it focused on the places where we need to do better at delivering the promise of the next generation, I think there's a lot of common ground. It's just harder to find it right now. It's interesting okay. you say that. And another thing that, that interested me when we were talking earlier is the fact that you're also a pilot. Mm-hmm. So, so we're in the process of, of building the Harlingen CISD aviation program where our students are going to get their private pilot license and have an opportunity to get their commercial drone pilot license simultaneously. But then knowing that you're a commercial pilot, knowing that you've been flying for years, it's, it's just something that, that I wanted to just ask you is, what are your thoughts on that, on Harlingen CISD and our approach in, in making aviation a possibility for our students in high school? It's, it's fun to get to share that because I, I wear all these other hats and then people learn this. I do this other, like <laughs> I have a secret identity um, <laughs> because I, I pursued being a pilot when I was in grad school. And then I sort of worked my way up from private pilot. I got bored. Like, what else can I do? I got my instrument ratings, became a commercial pilot. I really, I'm a teacher, so the pinnacle of, of aviation is being a flight instructor. And so I wanted to um, be a commercial pilot, which you need to be a flight instructor, and then, and then teach. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really fun avocation for me. And, of course, there are hard days when I'm like, you know, wouldn't it be easier just to fly airplanes? <laughs> um, it's very exciting that you've all innovated in this space. Um, it is an interesting time in these sort of highly technical um, fields. The demands, like in other um, STEM areas, are, are just vast, and the opportunities now are vast. Um, when I first learned to fly, this was a really rare career. It was really hard to break through. You had to have a lot of hours. You had to be maybe direct out of military service to enter um, a job flying airplanes. Um, but today... We have a, a massive pilot shortage. Um, the skills, I will say this, whether those students go on to careers in aviation, what they're learning is incredibly adaptable to all sorts of careers. So as a pilot, you understand a lot about um, um, mechanics. You understand a lot about sort of physics. You have to know a lot of physics to understand what makes an airplane fly. Um, Seems like a simple question, but it's actually quite complicated when you truly understand aerodynamics. Um, You have to understand problem solving, um, ruling out potential distractions to find out what the real problems are, and then going after a variety of solutions because the stakes are really high when you're flying airplanes. Mm -hmm. You have to slow things down to observe around you. These are highly transportable skills. Mm -hmm. So whether those students go on to careers in aviation or not, they're getting a basis of skills that are going to serve them in virtually any, any career path that they choose. So there you go, students. You're hearing it from a pilot, a flight instructor, a commercial pilot, saying that whether you pursue and go all the way into being a commercial pilot, going into the military and flying, whatever it is, it's the skills that you're going to learn. So please look into the av- aviation program as it, as it comes in next year. We want as many kids as we can applying for. We have limited seats, but we want as many kids as as we can applying for the aviation program so that so that we can make it one of the best in the country. What are your thoughts, Damon? Absolutely awesome. Uh, The fact that uh, what you do in your career and what you do in that cockpit are also the same. And also the fact that you're showing everybody the possibility of flight and being able to look above look below, look above to be able to see below to get a, a whole perspective of that uh what is it that you feel like whenever you're up there in the air like that um it, yeah that uh the, the sense of of uh, direct cause and effect is really powerful so in my normal life um the decisions i make and the actions i take take a while to play themselves out mm-hmm. in terms of their outcomes but when you're flying airplanes, you don't you have this sort of visceral immediacy of what you do and its success. That's really powerful. Um, as a teacher, the one of the biggest joys is getting to watch your student for the first time have their first solo. Because um, now I've trained someone to get in an airplane, fly it around, and land it without incident. And obviously those stakes are high. It's not like normal teaching where you can make a few mistakes. <laughs> um, you can't really make a mistake in your teaching here because, um, you know, lives are at um, potentially at, at risk. Um, so that's very powerful. 
you know, I, I don't have no good reason why I did this in addition to everything else I've done. But I will say, um, you know, as a first gen college student, if my dad were here, if he were still with us, um, he passed away um, about 18 months ago. He, um, he would tell you, my son is a self-made man. Mm. Because he he looks at what I've done, my career, my education, and he has he can't he would have no way of reflecting any shared experience, and so he, to him, my ability to to sort of take on some of these challenges was like I had it coursing some weird thing coursing through my veins. It's like, well, that's not the Martinez that didn't come from <laughs> Martinez DNA. It came from you know uh, the Bonilla side of our family. Like he would. He would parse it out that way, and it was very confusing to me. Every time he'd say, "Mijo, you're self-made," I'd be, "Dad, that's not true." Um, yeah, you couldn't show me college success. He certainly couldn't have, you know, t- show me a path towards learning to be a pilot. But um, he taught me I could do anything if I put my mind to it. And that's not actually probably true. There are, you know, when I was in my 20s, I probably couldn't go back and become a professional dancer. Like there are things I couldn't have done at those ages. But that belief that with hard work, that with effort, we can make our own way was a superpower in a way. No matter when, no matter what those self-doubts were, I had this thing going on in my head. I had the, the protective belief that if I just worked hard enough, that the self-doubt would be replaced by my ability to make something happen just by effort, that I could make lots of mistakes and still succeed, gave me permission to try. And, you know, I think that's, um, that's a powerful feeling, right, um, when, I, when I connect those dots between those different things I've done. Well, wow. I want to thank you for taking time with yes, us to be with us. You. I know that uh, all you do at the University of Texas and the education department just puts us in a position to excel as a district with our relationships. The fact that you gave us some insight into your aviation background, being a pilot and an instructor is, is interesting. The, I mean, we're also working hard to be this, this district of physical fitness. And then the fact that you mentioned just in our conversation earlier today that you've run every day for the last 13 years, you ride a Harley or play guitar. It's just very interesting. I think the message is that uh, you get out there and, and, and just take an eclectic view at life and do all the things that uh, make you happy. Because you know, when you look at life in, in, in general, it's, it's fast. It goes by in a flash. So I did pick True. up, you know, that, that's, that's a lesson I learned from you, Doc. Anything for the world? Demond, before we break? I think the last thing I wanted to know is what would you tell students um, that are interested in coming into UT? What are some of the things that they should be doing or preparing in order to <clears throat> be successful in your, at your university? Um, I, you know, and I, th- I think the things I might say would apply to any university, um, but I'll try to be specific where I can about UT Austin. Um, you know, I think it's important to, to look at the potential of the place and your passion. I mean, our students, when they're applicants, they're so focused on getting into UT Austin or getting into their dream school or whatever it is, that they forget to look at why. Mm. What is it that UT Austin can do that no one else can do for you? And I want applicants to think about that. Um, you know, our college is big and diverse, um, but we're really clear about who we are. We bring our whole selves to this work. Our students and applicants who are committed to being in service to their communities, we resonate with them. And I want them to know why they're there. Otherwise, they could go somewhere else and meet me another college at UT or another university. So, um, you know, doing your homework is really about understanding what their values are and how they align with what you're trying to get, what you want to achieve in your life. Um, You know, telling when students talk about that, when they're applying, it makes a big difference because we're always going to ask, are we a good match for them? Right. Not just are they great, but are we a good match? For their potential. So are finding that out, um, I think it's really important for students to talk with other students, but also with faculty. Um, take the time to talk to a professor. Find a spark of someone that makes you think about something you haven't before. 
And UT Austin is really good at this. We like to have our students bump into faculty, partly because we want them to know people. Um, you know, our, our commitment at UT Austin is, is also to serve all of Texas. So that's a big thing for me. Um, I think it's really important that as a state flagship that we really are in service. We don't have an en enrollment incentives. We don't have a tuition incentive. We're just trying to be available to be a match for the students that, that belong at UT Austin where we're capable of things that other places aren't. So I think that's something I would definitely advise students to look at as they're thinking about their choices. Excellent. So there you go, students. You're hearing it straight from the dean. Make mm -hmm. sure to do all you can to get your voice out and to meet as many people as possible. And the university is leaning forward. They, they want kids from our area. They want kids from all over the state. So you just got to put in the effort and, and anything is possible. So special thank you to you, Doc. Thank you. I also wanted to thank Dr. Nolan Perez. He's a board of regents for University of Texas at Austin. We're blessed to have him on our board. So yes. Dr. Perez, thank you for all you do. And sir, thank you for taking time to be with us today. Happy to do it. Thank you. Hope Take you care. all enjoyed. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.